heir to an extinguished fortune, Florentine nobility fallen on hard times, or perhaps a remittance man sent far from the family realm, the product of the third guard from the left. If so, the remittance would have been fairly meagre. Girolamo Pieri Nerli arrived in Australia with his friend and fellow painter Ugo Cotani, both in their early twenties and without much cash. They docked at Melbourne in 1885 with a swag of paintings from the days at the Accademia del Bellarte in Florence, and artefacts they picked up in Mauritius and other stopovers along the way with the intention of selling them on arrival. Sharing digs with Walt Withers and Arthur Lorario, Catani and Nerli from Florence and Siena respectively introduced the practices of the Mattioli School of Painting to a small band of Melbourne artists including Tom Roberts and Arthur Streeton. The matches, meaning patches or spots as they were known, brought the idea of doing quick painting sketches of nature on unprimed wooden panels and cigar box lids. Moving into 5 Collins Street, Melbourne the following year, the gregarious Nerli, both exotic and quixotic, and with a perchance for spinning anecdotes, gained some notoriety as something of an avant-garde experimenter. Despite his rigorous academic training, he also brought a spontaneous flowing style of painting known as the School of Swish, and as a disciple of Giovanni Bodini and Silvestro Lega, and no doubt his royal connections, created a minor stir in the still very conservative and nominally class-envying culture of late 19th century Australia. Visiting the Pinchkoffs of Studley Park Hall, a Madame Elmhurst Goode from Melbourne Society referred to Nurley as, quote, an ex-king travelling incognito. Travelling back to Australia from a trip abroad on the same ship as Catani and Nurley, she revealed their ability to imitate animal voices which, quote, so delighted the children. In 1886, Nurley moved to Sydney, the first of many moves between Melbourne, Sydney, Dunedin and Apia. He continued painting and selling works, including uh, to the Art Society of New South Wales, and continued to influence the Australian scene, particularly Charles Condor, where, as historian Bernard Smith suggests, quote, Condor's departure of the SS Orient owes as much to Nurley as Roberts. Condor's painting Bronte Beach, Queen's Birthday, owes much to the flattened picture plane of the Matches technique, as borrowed from the Nurley handbook. In 1889, he travelled to New Zealand for the South Seas exhibition and so missed the 9x5 exhibition he so transparently influenced. After time spent in Tasmania, Western Australia, and again back in Sydney, Nurley found himself in Samoa, where he bumped into Robert Louis Stevenson on the wharf in Apia and after some misgivings about his character, Stevenson agreed to pose for the artist, purportedly some 27 times as it turned out. Nurley was credited with completing at least two works of the great writer, one in oils and another charcoal drawing, which is in the State Library of New South Wales collection. During the sittings at the writer's home, Valima, the consumptive Stevenson, a compulsive writer, first penned a piece of doggerel dedicated to Nurley enlisting Scottish expressions and colloquialisms as he conjured with the artist's mysterious background and connections. Did ever mortal man here tell of say singular a furly as the coming to Apia here of the painter Mr Nurley? Recent evidence has emerged that suggests Stevenson during the prolonged portrait sessions wrote a good deal more than the poem dedicated to Nurley. In a correspondence with Leslie Kernow, the son of the then editor of the Sydney Morning Herald, found in the State Library of New South Wales collection, Stevenson alludes to a short story he wrote called The Remittance Man and is purportedly based on Nurley's life. When Stevenson wrote his book The Wrecker the same year, 1892, one chapter was titled The Remittance Man and supposedly refers to the real-life figure called Jack Buckland a trader around the Pacific and known to Stevenson. Nurley's nickname was Jack and it seems reasonable that the Jack Stevenson refers to in that chapter was in fact Nurley, who fitted the remittance man profile more than the hapless Buckland. 
In Stevenson's character of the remittance man in The Wrecker, he describes Norris Carthew needing to continually return to Sydney to pick up his remittance from a lawyer in order to prove his familial distance from his English home. Nurley was always returning to Sydney, presumably to pick up his quarterly payments from Italy. In a letter to Percy Spence, written in 1894 from Melbourne, Nurley entreats him to visit pictures by Alma, Tadama and Millet, as well as giving the thumbs up to the Melbourne girls. Damn bloody fine, he wrote. As a postscript, Nurley adds, quote, Stevenson's story about me is still with Leslie. R says never to show it, but I will some day, unquote. In the year the portraits were painted, 1892, Stevenson wrote to Leslie Curnow to say he was ill and unable to attend a lecture he'd planned for him. He adds, when you see Nurley, be sure to remind him to send the remittance man manuscript back to me for editing, unquote. Nurley must have shown the story to Curnow, whose delayed response to Stevenson's letter includes the words, quote, I was greatly taken by the short story you wrote for Nurley. The remittance man is worthy of being published, unquote. The story of the remittance man, if it exists, was never returned to Stevenson, who died a few years later in 1894. New versions of the Stevenson portrait turned up and Nurley may have added to the originals and sold them in order to survive. The manuscript, acknowledged by at least three people including Stevenson, has never been found. Did he and Kerno plan to release it after Stevenson's death and somehow it was lost before they could? Or did Nurley, acting on Stevenson's advice never to show it, destroy it? Or intriguingly, was it stored somewhere and forgotten? Nurley's legacy in Australian art is enduring. The mystery of the missing story may well be too. Charles Condor and Tom Roberts were friends and fellow travellers in the art world of the late 19th and early 20th century. Their lives were bound through the common love of painting and especially so as men sharing a devotion to the new Australian aesthetic which reveled in the depiction of light and nature. The older Roberts was something of a mentor to the more mercurial Condor. Both men stood above Coogee Beach in the autumn of 1888 and together painted that iconic crescent of sand with its uh, transitional layers of colour from the deep blue of the ocean to the turquoise of the shelving bank to the mauves and ochres of wet sand interspersed with the foaming waves as they ran up the peopled beach. Each painting reflected something of the character of each artist. Roberts was quiet, intensely sensitive to nuance. Condor was urbane, impish and lent towards design and decoration. Both admired these traits in the other, traits that took them in different directions in both their art and their life. Condor and Roberts travelled to London and Paris with Condor finding his feet as a genuine bohemian dandy, while Roberts languished in the more conservative environs of the Chelsea Art Club in London. Meanwhile, Condor was involved in a literary and arts magazine called The Yellow Book and spent his time with Oscar Wilde, Aubrey Beardsley and others who met regularly and were labelled the decadents. Streeton, an old friend, watched over his progress but was disapproving of his lifestyle and although disillusioned by his failure to find an audience for his work in London, Robert still supported his old friend when criticised by people like John Longstaff and others. In an unpublished letter to the Melbourne Argus, Robert says of Condor, quote, Some people thought he was not always a hard worker. Some thought he couldn't draw or paint. But we, his intimates, knew they were as much misled in one case as in the other. Condor died at only 41 of complications brought on by syphilis. Before he died, Condor wrote to his friend Roberts, Nothing can exceed the pleasures of that last summer, when, I fancy, all of us lost the ego somewhat of our natures in looking at what was nature's best art and identity. Ilyath Gruner lived for many years in the eastern suburbs of Sydney, 
and had brought a house overlooking Tamarama at 12 Ashley Street, Waverley, and next door to Julian Ashton. During this time, he painted a harbour scene uh, from the property of lawyer John Lane Mullins called Killerton, and in a second version added two children levitating above the lawn. In response to the second version, uh, the writer Dora Wilcox Moore speculated that the two children bore a likeness to a young Brian Cannell, a friend of Gruner's and a talented dancer, although someone who Julian Ashton's wife described as uh, that dancer, he was not a good fit, and uh, a chap called Jack Leckie, who lived with Gruner in the last years. Many others insisted that the two boys symbolised Gruner's so-called illegitimate son to a woman called Peter. After Gruner died from alcoholism, Wilcox Moore um, wrote of her friend, I am haunted by the spirit of Gruner, painter of quiet things, and the other ghosts who populated his less than peaceful slumbers. Norman Lindsay said of Gruner, it is futile trying to define that blackness of depression which is the nemesis of all highly sensitised visions in creative art. I think he was only at ease when alone with nature, as the exquisite quality of his landscapes attest. Max Meldrum's school was an active part of the Melbourne art scene in the 1910s and through the 20s and 30s. His underlying thesis was as dogmatic as his character and revolved around the principle of tonalism and direct appearances. His studio and method became a mecca for artists starting out on their careers, including A. M. E. Bale, Polly Hurry, A. E. Newbury and others. In 1916, Ewer Smith also opens the Julius Studios in Sydney and is visited by Meldrum, Gruner, Hans Heysen and the Lindsay Brothers. In 1917, Meldrum was working hard to maintain his credibility in the face of an oncoming freight train of modernism and in the same year delivered a lecture entitled The Invariable Truths of Depictive Art at the Victorian Artists' Society. This coincided with a knife attack on his painting Peasant of Pace, hanging at the National Gallery of Victoria. Although regarded as something of an advancement on the Impressionist school in Australia, Meldrum and his followers, Percy Leeson, Newbury, Richard McCann, and for a short time, Clarice Beckett, the pace of change would quickly swamp his well-intentioned quest to uphold his insistence on what he called optical integrity. Meldrum, according to uh, author Margot Tasker in her book on per Percy Leeson, virtually declared war on the modernist movement, and along with Percy Leeson and Norman Lindsay was especially scathing of people like Gauguin and Cezanne. Ilyath Gruner is even pilloried for liking Gauguin, Norman Lindsay in a letter to Howard Hinton writes, quote, You are right to find Gruner's interest in the obscene Gauguin inexplicable. Among the various shocks that I have experienced during some 47,000 years, I count the discovery that Gruner had expressed an appreciation for this frightful savage to be one of the severest. When Gauguin stopped off in Melbourne on his way back to Tahiti in 1903, he made his way directly to the young Meldrum's house in Melbourne, only to find he was living in Brittany. His intention was to remonstrate with him over his less than generous appraisal of his work. However, the newly formed Meldrum Circle gathered together to meet and argue their position on Meldrum's behalf, ending in a reconciliation of sorts. Lunch was served and now the historic photo of Gauguin standing at the centre back of this unlikely gathering was taken. He is seen looking across at what seems a resentful Justice Jorgensen, who defiantly maintained his disdain. Gauguin died in Tahiti, vowing never to return to Melbourne again. Bernard Hall, a wonderful and sometimes underrated painter, made this work in 1929. The model and the globe is an arresting image of a model, quite possibly his wife, who posed for him for many of his pictures. The original painting, which now hangs in the National Gallery of Victoria, was preceded by a small painting sketch and was initially thought to be a depiction of the celestial globe made by Coronelli for Louis XIV in 1683. 
Its opalescent and marbled blues looked somewhat like the Coronelli globe, though some have hinted at the uncanny resemblance to photos of our own Earth from space. And that perhaps uh, Hall had only what could be described as a painter's intuitive imagination, and that imaginative result resembles very closely the reality we know today. As well as Hall's fascination with monograms, uh, perhaps an ongoing joke on his name vis-a-vis -vis Hall Marx, he came back to the idea of travel and distant places. His drawing the sea is a compelling notion on the sea, travel and distant voyages. A painter of sensual domesticity, Hall's secret imaginative life took him to places of uncanny prescience and like William Blake and Samuel Palmer before him, possessed an unexpected visionary capacity. With Percy Leeson's painting The Student and Claris Beckett's Still Life, a uniting element was a mysterious press rose found in the pages of a book of poetry, Leaves of Grass by Walt Whitman. All human beings have three lives, said Gabriel Garcia Marquez public, private, secret. And Percy and Claris shared a sort of collaboration with their respective careers and lives. They each valued the contribution of the other. Percy was married, Claris never did. Percy and his wife eventually moved to New York. Claris stayed with her family in Beau Morris, Victoria, after a brief flirtation with Arthur Mundy. On a July day in 1935, Claris died of pneumonia. Percy wrote a long letter describing the day of the funeral. The day was beautiful. It seemed in some vague way like Claris herself, gentle and kindly. The July sun made every view beautiful. The bare trees of the avenue, the house, the shops, the trams. One could not look anywhere and say, there is an ugly sight petrol pumps, commercial signs, and the crude architecture of a new suburban street, all were pleasant colour patches. Tom Roberts' portrait of Ada Crossley hangs in the National Gallery of Australia in Canberra. Roberts wanted to convey the character of an Australian who was young and forward-looking. She was a wonderful singer and was a contralto with the Melbourne-based Austral Salon of Music, Literature and Arts before further studies in Europe, debuting at London's Queen's Hall in 1885. When Roberts painted her, she was only 17 and only starting out on her career. She always referred to herself as, quote, a regular rough bush youngster. Roberts wanted to convey the character of an Australian who was young and forward-looking. He said that when looking at art, those which, works which held him were portraits where the intense feeling of humanity holds all through, and he thought it important to convey a sense of the living presence of a person. Ada was painting in what Roberts described as the textures of, and colours of the Australian bush. His national fervour to idealise the typical Australian character as he saw it at the time was absolute. In 2016, Belinda Jackson, in an article in the Sydney Morning Herald, said, By 1900, Roberts was well immersed in his mission to paint the face of Australia. By 2018, his idealisation of a native-born Australian, uh, as he put it, uh, would have been difficult to reconcile, but his conviction to pursue that intense feeling for humanity would still hold through and still convey that sense of a living presence of a person. The young Arthur Streeton was, like many of his contemporaries, something of a romantic. His obsession with a heartfelt young woman called Florrie Walker, the daughter of a wealthy landowner, will always be something of a mystery in Australian art. A declaration of love by a struggling artist to the then 16-year-old Florrie in the late 19th century would have been considered inappropriate, and so we can only speculate as to whether Streeton's obsession was ever openly declared to her, or, as many letters to friends like Tom Roberts hint, was always only a secret longing. 
When Streeton painted Spring in 1889, he secreted a scratched message under the layers of paint, which was discovered by conservator Marco Cox from the National Gallery of Victoria. The message said, quote, Flory is my sweetheart, and in another place on the painting he'd written the name Flory and his own name Smike next to it. His habit of making declarations of love, which would never be seen, gives credence to the discovery of this letter found in a bottle amongst boxes and of letters and artefacts in a house in Heidelberg. It reads, Dear Flory, I have admired you for many years from afar and now have come to love you truly and in the sweetest and tenderest way. You may never know my true feelings as I feel sure they would not be returned. I entrust this most sincere sentiment to the seas and the winds forever. Smike Struton. The other amazing discovery in the underpainting of this picture, Spring, was a naked woman with flowing hair. Did the real flurry pose, or was this Struton's erotic imagination at play? In a letter to Bulldog, Tom Roberts, in 1892, Streeton wrote, quote, Forgotten but the warmth of a downy cheek and the weight of rich tresses tumbling and curling about my neck. Before he died, Streeton burnt many of his personal letters and Florrie gave much of her personal correspondence away. In another letter to Roberts in 1890, he says, quote, Bless her wherever she is. And he follows with, This, of course, is awfully confidential, Bulldog. So this is a Hilda Ricks Nicholas painting of her backyard and it was painted in um, 1920 and um, it was when she lived in a rented um, premises um, on Cremorne Point overlooking Sirius Cove. And I've added here a um, whippersnipper because um, it was a very untidy backyard and it really needs to be cleaned up and, um, and uh, we need to see a lovely lawn. Um, growing there where the kids can play. This is another um, Arthur Street in painting and um, it's called Sorrento Naples in brackets also known as Balmoral Beach 1897. Um, I don't know why they gave these some of these paintings European names, but I think um, it was something to do with the marketplace and trying to sell them. What's interesting about this particular painting is um, is this unusual object here, which um, I, I can't identify. Some people have said it's like a, cl a small cloud that's floated down, but that seems unlikely. Uh, it could also be like a blue bottle that um, is blown up and um, and has blown up into the trees. Um, I've, I've seen that happen um, and um, that's the only explanation I can give. It's a very unusual um, object and um, not, not commonly known or seen in these parts. This is a um, Tom Roberts painting called The Paris Hat in 1892. Uh, and um, what a lot of people don't realise is that um, um, the um, Apple Company um, has been around a lot longer than we think, and they, um, they and they produced an Apple earphone. Um, this is the second less famous version, um, and uh, I'm interested in the music she's listening to there. This is a really beautiful little um, painting, um, which is based on a photograph of Jessie Trail, a wonderful Australian artist who was a fantastic etcher and painter. Um, the, the, it was by an unknown photographer uh, uh, and it was done in 1920 and what's really interesting about this and nobody really knows if you can see there um, she has um, a tattoo on her upper left arm and um, it looks like it's based on a etching she did called uh, The Drinking Man uh, 1914. Um, so um, that's, that's a little unknown history which um, has been revealed to you right now.
So this is a painting uh, by Max Meldrum and um, it's called My Lady's Table and he's added this t last little touch here which I think is a rose and um, we, we think it might have some reference to um, Clarice Beckett because she used to wear a little rose on um, her tunic um, or behind her ear. There was a painting that was done um, of um, some objects on a table and after seeing Pygmalion the play it looks like he's actually trying to turn this woman into um, something that was alive. Interesting connection though with um, Claris in that regard. So this is an Arthur Street uh, picture. It's a beautiful little still life and um, there's no date on it but we think it was painted around 1888 and um, it's called uh, Still Life with Chops and Eggs and um, what's really interesting is this beautiful little vase here uh, made out of milk glass. Um, we found this fragment down at um, Sirius Cove, genuinely found it down at Sirius Cove, dug up in the ground and I think there's a huge um, op a chance that that may be the same piece of um, pottery uh, that was featured in this painting. Extraordinary.